In 2015, every United Nations member state made the commitment to ensure women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership. This builds on previous international commitments like the 1995 Beijing Platform for Action. The rationale is not just equity, fairness and rights and representation, but also because it makes for stronger governance and better economic outcomes. The diversity dividend is well documented. In the private sector, more women in senior managerial positions and on boards correlates with an increased return on investment. In governance bodies, gender balance correlates with increased emphasis on long-term growth drivers like environmental sustainability, education and health. So with such a strong case for gender balance, what's the current state of play? One in four parliamentarians is now female. Only one in five speakers of parliament or government ministers is a woman. And less than 7% of country leaders are women. In the private sector, almost one third of companies globally have no women at all in board positions. A new index provides some insight. In a survey of 10,000 respondents in 2019, more than half expressed discomfort with women as leaders in both corporate and political life. So with progress this slow and challenges persisting, what works? Welcome to this session at the United Nations Global Compact on Target Gender Equality. I have a wonderful guest with me from New Zealand who I'd like to introduce now. Michelle, over to you. Kia Tato. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Um, and it's my pleasure to join uh, you today. I'm the current chair of PwC in New Zealand and also uh, just recently stepped down from the co-chair of Champions for Change in New Zealand. Um, Michelle, as the chair of PwC New Zealand, you are both a national role model and you've been a practical catalyst for change in promoting other women up through the pipeline. Tell us a little bit about why it is so important to promote women into leadership roles in business. And given this current situation of COVID, tell us a little bit about why it's particularly important at the moment and what the impact is for business results. Look, I'm not going to summarize all of the literature on this point because there is a lot, um, which is great because I think uh, if you went back uh, in time, the conversations we would have had around participation in women would have come very much um, typically from a moral perspective. Uh, whereas we now have overwhelming data that will support that having women with a voice at the table and being involved in making decisions uh, at a company level and a societal level, you actually get better outcomes. So companies make more money, uh, they are for their shareholders, uh, they're more resilient, um, they can weather storms, they think about risks differently and are unlikely to think or less likely to think of, um, to, to suffer from group think. Uh, and I think that's really important both at a business level and also a societal level, um, as I said. So the evidence is overwhelming on that. The other thing that it would say is, you know, this is not just about um, numbers or representation. It's about active participation. And that's where inclusion um, is so important. Uh, for years, we talked about diversity and inclusion. <laughs> Uh, or DNI. I mean, I think we need to um, turn those words around the other way. It should be inclusion, and through inclusion, you get diversity. No good having somebody sit there, sitting in a room with brilliant ideas, and um, unable to contribute, all those ideas not being look, listened to. And the literature again would say, really, for women to be heard, or for women's voices to be heard, and for that to be effective, the magic number is three three sitting around the table to support each other uh, and back each other up. So I think that's really important. Then you roll through to um, COVID. I, mean, I am concerned, as I'm sure everybody is, around the impacts on uh, the pandemic, uh, not only in the short term, but in the medium and, and long term. Uh, we are going through significant change and the decisions that are being made 
um, right now and over the coming weeks and months will impact not only the current uh, generation of women, but those who follow us. And it's really important, therefore, that we have women's voices at the table uh, so that the best decisions can be made uh, that will set us all up uh, for the future. Now, that's at a societal level, but it's also important at a business level. Thank you. Such great points. And the United Nations Global Compact is actually launching a target gender equality initiative and wanting to roll those good practices out. So I would love it if you could share New Zealand Global Women's Breakthrough Women's Leadership Program. I know that you have been a very active champion for that program and I saw you in action and I saw just how impactful that program was. So I would love you to tell us about the program and the difference that it has really made in creating a pipeline for senior women in New Zealand. So we, did, we set this program up around about uh, 10 years ago now, and we thought that it would be just an initial um, program maybe with, you know, for a few years, but it has continued to gain momentum and be successful. And it was, it was requested by uh, our investment partners. So Global Woman, um, a, a group of 300 of New Zealand's most uh, influential women at a um, government, business, um, societal level, uh, who are active in uh, ch uh, changing um, and improving the participation of women uh, and leadership of women. And we have a number of organisations that work with us. So P PwC is one of those support organisations and there's many others. And those organisations would say, well, that's all very well for you, Michelle, because you've, uh, you are where you are, but how can you help us bring through our brilliant uh, talent? We, we employ a lot of women, but they're not getting through to leadership roles. So we're trying hard, but it's not happening. How can you help? So we set up a, a programme uh, for uh, women who are, these are women who are already a high potential, you know, they might be level three, four in an organisation and it's about supercharging them so that they can get into C-suite roles or board roles, um, not only in corporates, but also in uh, public sector and NGOs and so forth. And it's been hugely successful and I do have some um, um, data here that I got the team um, to, to, to put forward from me. So of our alumni who've been through the program, and we've now got nearly 300 of these. So 50 to 70% of all participants are promoted within one to three years of um, graduation. So these are already, you know, high up in organisation, but they have, have moved forward. 5% uh, have gone to CEO positions, 15% to board positions, six to eight uh, to general managers and so on and so forth. Some have gone off and, and started their own companies, um, et cetera. So it has been significant for the women involved, but also for the companies. Uh, and often what happens as these women have gone on, these, uh, on this program is it holds up a mirror to the organization. And there definitely for this to be successful has to be a three-way partnership. So there has to be a sponsor within the organisation and that has got to be somebody senior. So really someone uh, at C-suite level. Uh, you've got the, the woman um, herself and then also the, uh, the director of our programme. And they will set up objectives at the beginning uh, of the year, because this is a, a significant investment in time and money, uh, and they will hold themselves uh, to account as, as that progresses. So uh, we are thrilled with that program and it continues um, to pay dividends. And we didn't set out to be a training organization, but we seem to have become one. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, I know when you and I serve on the board of New Zealand Global Women Together, and as you say, it was, uh, thought initially that it might be a short-term program, but it's been so successful. Could you tell us what you think the top three most important elements of the program? Is it the sponsor relationship? Is it the peer cohort that the women develop together? Is it the quality of the training? Is it the fact that they get noticed across their company and develop an external network as well? What would you say the three most important elements of the program are for others who are listening and may want to try to emulate? The peer um, network, I think, is significant because these 30 women go through a, a lot of learning together and they support each other 
um, through that program. You know, there's, there's, there's birth, deaths and marriages, there's changing of roles, there's all of this, and it continues. So they continue to support each other. And, um, and I know they continue to meet after the program and they'll challenge each other and they'll say, well, that was all very good, Amanda. Last year, you said that you were going to do X, Y, and Z and you haven't done it. So they hold each other to account. They lift each other up. They support, um, support those women to be confident and to have their voice. So I think that is a definite um, uh, magic in the program. The, the sponsorship within the organisation is absolutely critical. So that's why we look for somebody who is in C-suite, um, typically a, a male leader, um, we'll often, often find, um, because we all know that for women to be successful, for anyone to be successful, you need sponsorship within your organisation. Um, so there's that piece. The third, um, I'm going to go for four. Can I go for four? Oh, I'm going to go for four. You can. So there's, there's the third one, I think, is through through the uh, the membership of Global Women. So as I mentioned, 300 um, of, you know, the most probably connected women um, in New Zealand. We, we help to support that program, open doors, um, provide mentor, um, mentoring facilities, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we're trying to push all of our experience and our scar tissue onto these women so that they can learn from our mistakes. That bit, and then the final one is uh, creating a greater connection of those women to New Zealand society more broadly, uh, so that they can feel it doesn't matter where you come from or what your specialization might be, doesn't matter whether you're an accountant or whether you're a lawyer or whether you're a sports psychologist, actually you can have a voice in improving New Zealand society. So think bigger, be bold, because um, that's what leaders do. They don't, they're not defined by their current role. So there's a large uh, community uh, project that they have to do, well, that they do do and embrace um, together. Love it, think bigger and be bold, brilliant. So that brings me to the last question. What advice do you have for other senior women who want to support gender equality and love it if you can talk about uh, some of the initiatives that you've been active in with New Zealand Global Women in doing that. Um, so one of the things, Amanda, you mentioned it already was uh, at Global Women we, dis we, we looked uh, for good examples uh, overseas and what had worked and in Australia there was a group uh, Male Champions for Change so um, uh, Chief Executive Woman in Australia, a group there, had joined, created a male champions of change in order to get change. So men and women um, working together uh, in order to uh, help organisations to embrace diversity and inclusion and get cut through. So in New Zealand, what we did was we created a, an, a structure or an organisation called Champions for Change. So it's men and women working together uh, of 40 of the largest um, organisations in New Zealand across all sectors, uh, working together to improve uh, leadership, to have a more diverse and included, included, diverse and inclusive uh, leadership in Aotearoa in New Zealand. Uh, so that has, that's been uh, really successful and uh, to be a champion, you have to sign up. Uh, we measure ourselves, uh, there's, there's uh, targets that we aim for across our organisations of what we call 40-40-20. Uh, so that is in terms of you know, senior roles in an organisation, 40% male, 40% female, and 20% um, either, uh, could be of, of, of any gender. Uh, and we're doing pretty well in terms of meeting those targets. So there's a piece in there around um, good old competition, uh, but there's also sharing um, good ideas and supporting uh, one another and um, numbers don't lie. So getting those numbers out there, sharing that, sharing good practices, how, and enabling flexible working. So a multitude um, of, of those things. Last year we did a, um, a project on gender pay gap and how do you actually measure it and what do you do with that information? So, uh, so I think Working, co collaborating with others in the space to get cut through, I think is really important. And the other thing I'd say is, uh, you know, for, for senior women and women who are leaders, you know, get involved because if not us, then who? And I probably stood back for too long, um, thinking I perhaps wasn't senior enough, but actually, um, you know, it's like 
we all have monkeys on our shoulder. We all underestimate where we are and what influence we have. And so I think find like-minded people uh, and work with them to affect change. Oh, true. I'm delighted to have with me today two incredible speakers from the United Kingdom, Marcia Barischiano, who is the Global Head of Corporate Responsibility for the Relics Group, and also currently the Chair for the Global Compact Network. Marcia, welcome. Thank you, Amanda. It's such a pleasure to talk with you. Oh, in thinking about target gender equality, the UK has really been a leader in legislating for equal pay. Can you tell us how you are seeing companies put in place measures to comply with that? Yes, um, it's, it's such an important time for us um, here in the United Kingdom because we do have this legislation and it's a race to the top. I think it's about getting the data, understanding that data, and then putting improvement measures in place to move the needle from whatever your starting point is to where you want to go. Um, and I think a main driver of the gender pay gap um, legislation um, is that it's about the underrepresentation of women in senior leadership positions because we need to remember that pay inequality is actually illegal. So everybody should be paid the same for equal work. What this is looking at is that difference between um, you know, the men and women in the organization and that gap between what they earn. And what they were looking at with three years now of having to report on gender pay gap, what, is, what are the steps that companies have been taking and what is actually making a difference? So if we look at just closing the median pay gap, um, if I give you an example, undertaking succession planning, that decreased the pay gap for uh, 28 of, um, of the companies that were reporting. Again, that had a contributing, positive contributing factor in reducing pay gap. Um, having a returners program, uh, looking at uh, diversity targets and making sure those are in place and targets not only from a quantitative point of view, but a qualitative uh, place uh, as well. Looking at um, having a sense of what the policies are and undertaking those reviews, they had a positive effect. Undertaking unconscious bias training, there's a number of these things. Oh, fantastic, and I think all of those are such practical tools for people to take away. Is there anything in particular that you at Relics, which is a global leader in sustainability and SDG research, uh, are finding is working for you particularly well internally. You mentioned enhanced maternity leave, but from some of the research we've done at the World Bank, it shows also that making provisions for parental leave and sometimes uh, even enforcing a, a portion of paternity leave can also make a difference. Can you speak to, to that in terms of what you have been seeing internally? Yes, and I think that's a good point, Amanda, because just because something is on the books and you can do it, you have to socialize it as well. We have to create a culture where it is perfectly acceptable and comfortable for men if they choose to in um, agreement with their partners to take to share maternity leave, which is the case here in the United Kingdom. Uh, before we move completely on from the pay gap analysis, I just wanted to say that some of the steps that we're taking at Relix, and we are uh, Europe's largest media company, we're about data and analytics um, in science law, um, in risk, and also in events. So we are looking um, at the steps that we can take. They have included things like creating job architecture, so that we can begin to understand what are similar jobs. Without that, there's too much subjective um, input that, that gets into the mix, and you, you really want to try and minimize that. Of course, there'll always be subjectivity, but having that kind of uh, rigor helps with having job architecture. Um, we're looking at um, having salary increase guidelines when we make job offers, and also for internal 
uh, promotion and adjustments. And we've also incorporated pay equity checks um, in terms of out of cycle adjustments that are made and just doing pay equity audits as well and doing those on a uh, frequent basis because that will all help with the kind of headline statistics. So the COVID pandemic has really put pressure on existing inequalities and we're seeing that a gender informed response to COVID could add 13 trillion to the global economy by 2030, according to the latest McKinsey research. We know that women are being hit the hardest with this pandemic. So what is it that you're seeing from a corporate perspective that is really helping your employees get through this difficult period? Well, it's certainly about flexible working and, it, and we have three pillars, one which is around governance and under that heading, it's making sure that we know what our metrics are, ensuring that we have uh, governance structures like an inclusion council, an inclusion working group, right. that we engage our business leaders. And particularly on the policy side, it's really looking at having um, flexible working policies that have a minimum threshold. So it's true that if you're a global company like we are, we operate in 40 countries around the world, there are different standards, different norms, but we wanna have a, a floor um, with our flexible working so that um, everyone can at least get the same uh, basic level of um, support for, for flexible working. And, and that we know that really makes a difference. Um, there are other things, in inclusive workplace um, around uh, looking at specific gender initiatives, race and ethnicity, supporting employee resource groups, which allow diversity to be expressed in different ways. And then on the far side of this pillar is looking at learning and communication. We need to do the training. And it's yes. not only the usual suspects like unconscious bias training, but we started something which is called psychological safety training so that people feel comfortable about saying, what they think, what they believe, um, that they feel comfortable about asking questions. Um, and that requires an atmosphere of trust. So we want to foster more of that. And that's something that we're putting a lot of focus on. So just to finish up, in your role as chair of the UK Global Compact Network, you're dealing with a range of other chairs from around the world. Are there any particular good practices that stand out to you in terms of target gender equality? Yes, that might replicate. Well, I think that we are very lucky that the UN Global Compact exists. It is the largest movement of, of business and other civil society partners, and they make lots of research available and they make tools available. And one of them is so important. In fact, that's how we met, right, Amanda? <laughs> yes. um, around the kind of first iteration of the gender gap analysis tool. This is great, it's free, you can use it, and it's very common sense. And you just go through it, nobody has to see that information except you and your company. But it really helps you to, to look at your current practice and where the gap is for best practice. And it offers practical guidance about steps that you can take um, to address those gaps. And I think, you know, we are encouraging not only at the UK network of the Global Compact, but Global Compact networks around the world to use this free tool, the gender um, gap analysis tool, to help companies to assess where they are today and to help them get to where they want to be tomorrow.